There is no way of knowing when our days are numbered. We spend every day wandering through, blind to the daily dangers around us. The cars speeding on the highway, the nutters downtown, choking on a piece of filet mignon when you're out to dinner with your lover. <laughs> I grew up surrounded by violence, watching my mom get beat to a pulp almost daily by men she used to get drugs and who knows what else. I moved out at 14, sleeping on floors and couches of drug dealers and tweakers, people addicted to abuse, people who tried to make me comfortable, all the while doing the opposite. My wife Dory and her stepdad Billy have always had a strained relationship. It's never easy when our parents remarry, but she did her best to support her mom in the new relationship, keeping the new dad at arm's length. She moved out as soon as she could, and the connection with her mom was almost lost. My mother-in-law, Cindy, is a 60-something retiree, a kind woman who rediscovered a bond with her daughter once our son was born. For almost eight years, we've seen her twice a week for family dinner. We've gotten close to her, and she never feels out of place in our house, almost like the rift between her and my wife never happened. Cindy was in a rough relationship, an alcoholic who was verbally abusive and limited her interactions with the rest of the world. This was never something anyone but her saw. Cindy would tell us stories about how Billy would ask if she enjoyed giving her ex-husband, the fat man, blowjobs. This was actually a regular topic of conversation, especially after she'd have dinner with us. Occasionally, my wife and I would visit Cindy and Billy in their home. We spent time assembling a stroller for our son, enjoying Christmas cookies and candies together. While our exchanges were limited, they were mostly pleasant. He was never rude or condescending. We didn't bring up the conversation Cindy had had with us. We didn't want to make things worse for her. The man we knew in person was not the same one my mother-in-law talked about at family dinner. Rewind to three years ago. Cindy's abuse at home is getting worse. After months of debating and arguing for and against divorce, Cindy finally makes a decision that her life is worth living and that it should be a happy one. Why shouldn't her home be filled with laughter and light, all the things we seek out as human beings, connection with one another? We wanted these things for her. We gave those things to her in our household, tried to fill in gaps with all the love and support we could muster. The papers were filed, the process begun. Billy started making threats, talking about suicide. He even bought and paid for a burial plot down the street. This was a man determined to guilt her into loving him, staying with him. Why? That was never really apparent. For the record, unless someone is actively attempting suicide, the police won't do anything. The three or four times we called the police, they'd said, unless he's actively a danger to himself or others, nothing we can do. We wanted to help them find a way to end their marriage that was safe for both of them. So, Cindy stayed with us for roughly one month, sleeping on the fold-out couch in the den. While it wasn't ideal, it was a blessing to know she was safe and happier. It was what we had to offer. It was enough in this moment. We spent evenings discussing how we would handle the day he had to move out, the day the divorce was finalized. We talked out every possible outcome. What if he won't leave the house when we ask? What if he already left of his own accord? Then that day came. We packed up the car and drove to her house, ready to tackle whatever was thrown at us. We felt so prepared. This was going to be easy, right? We were surprised to find him home, sitting in his chair, watching TV. We were courteous, asking how he was, making pleasantries. He bantered with us, made us feel relaxed. He even agreed to go upstairs and help pick out items to pack. This was happening. While Dory and I worked on loading the suitcase downstairs, we talked about how this was going and remarking how thankful we were that this whole thing was almost behind us. Cindy was upstairs talking to him about the items he wanted. Yes, that shirt, 
No, not those pants. As Cindy was bringing these items down to us, we continued to pack and marveled at how well this was going. While Billy was quiet, he wasn't argumentative. We didn't have to get the police to force him out. He was actually going to go on his own. Yes, this was a win. We had almost had him packed. We were kneeling together downstairs, waiting for the last bits of clothing to come down. After the third or fourth round of clothing was packed, it happened. A sound like I'd never heard, followed by a silence like I've never felt. It reverberated through the house, through my body. The three of us sat there silently, trying to comprehend what just happened. This is my disaster. And let me tell you, it's nothing like they portray on the TV or in the movies. There is no way to prepare yourself for that deafening moment when the sound of a gun goes off. There's no way to know how calm or panicked you will be in a situation like that. There is no way to know that it's coming. Cindy began to cry. Dory started to make her way up the stairs, and I told her, no, absolutely not. You get off those stairs, you take your mother, get the phone, get outside, call the police, just get out. Once they were safe outside, I began to climb the stairs. I'm not sure if I was breathing, but I must have been because I was calling to him, yelling his name, asking if he was all right. Billy, are you all right? Hoping that the sound was mistaken for something else, furniture being bumped or maybe he fell over. I kept repeating the same words over and over. Are you okay? I'm coming upstairs. Are you okay? Billy man, are you all right? I'm coming upstairs. Each step, like some foggy dream sequence, the silence still ringing, except for my own words. Only two possible outcomes lie ahead. Either he is dead, or he will shoot me once I get up there, something I accepted from the moment I started my ascent, something I had to do if it meant keeping my family safe. Walking down the hall toward the bedroom door, I realize how calm I feel in this moment. My life has primed me for this. When I got to their bedroom, I was not prepared for what I saw. The top of his head was missing completely, and it was evident that his heart was still beating. Blood still spouting onto the wall. The gun lay silent on his chest. I turned and left as fast as I could, wanting to get back to my family. The 911 call seemed to last forever. Cindy was too upset to talk. Dory was trying to console her while wrapping her brain around what had just occurred. So I took the phone. Calmly, I explain what happened. The police are on their way, and then she says it. I'm gonna need you to go inside and perform CPR. I'm sorry, what? If you don't know how, I can walk you through it. I'll hold while you get back inside. She was insistent. I kept repeating that this wasn't exactly an option. I'm getting frustrated with her. It's not that I don't know how, it's that he doesn't have a top to his head. I'm pretty sure CPR is not going to work here. She notes the report, and we wait for the cops to arrive. It's a goddamn parade. The police come. The coroner comes. We talk to a social worker who puts us in contact with some bio-waste cleanup folks. Hazmat crews. They don outfits similar to the ones you've seen in movies like Outbreak. Almost otherworldly. And surprisingly... They're covered by your homeowner's insurance. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> the crew noted that this was clearly intentionally as destructive as it could have been. A 357 revolver with hollow point bullets held just far enough from himself to, make, to create the most dramatic effect. He wanted to ruin this house, make it so bad she couldn't bear to live there anymore. He wanted to take as much from her in that moment as possible. Oh, and the police? <laughs> they made things worse by not wearing booties when entering the bedroom. Lovely. I didn't sleep for a week. Every time I closed my eyes, I would see him laying there in that bed, blood squirting from the gaping hole that was the top of his head. In all our planning and discussions, it never once occurred to us that he could have opened fire on the three of us at any point. He could have easily blown us away then taken himself. 
Why didn't that even occur to us? Cindy couldn't be home for another few months since Hazmat had a lot of work to do. It took nearly a week to tear everything out. Nearly everything in her bedroom had to be thrown away. We collected a few more things for her and took them back to our place. The contractors would spend the next few months putting it all back together. We knew this was going to be a long road to recovery. Could she still live there? Was that even doable? Initially, I was angry, almost jealous, that this feeble old man could do something that I had attempted three times, and he made it look so easy. Thankfully, that's not where I am today. I have reminders, reasons to stay here. I never went to therapy. Hell, until now, I've never really talked about it much. I added it to the pile of shit that happens, with the tweakers, the drug dealers, my mother, this wasn't something I wanted to rehash with everyone I knew. What I saw, I will never forget, but I'm not gonna let it take away from what I have. I won't give it the power to own me. Instead, we got tattooed. A peacock we share, and one just for myself. A woman committing suicide, which turns into butterflies. Something horrific becomes something beautiful. My emotional pain becomes my physical pain. It works for me. Well, Cindy still lives in that house, still sleeps in that room. We collaborated on new carpet, paint swatches. We involved ourselves in helping her turn that home into a space she wanted to be. After nearly 20 years of abuse, it was the least we could do. We bought sage and cleansed the house, making statements about filling the house with laughter, light, love, all the things he denied her, all the things we wanted to take from this experience and create daily. To this day, they both thank me for going upstairs, seeing that for them. I knew that they would never be able to return from that. I knew what some, seeing something like that could do to a person. We've celebrated what we call Life Day every year since that day, on the anniversary of that horrific moment where our lives changed, for the better. Not because he is gone, but because we are alive and she is finally happy. We spend those life days together, taking in art, gardens, sunshine, finding things in the world to appreciate and remembering our lives are still intact. Vamp first timer, Jennifer Valdez.